The last time I looked at a B-Link mini PC was a couple of months ago. The SCR8 was a refresh of the SCR7 with a new Apple-like aesthetic and a price tag that was a clear reaction to the aggressively priced M4 Mac Mini. I said at the time I believed that if companies like B-Link wanted to continue making premium mini PCs, then they'd have to learn from Apple. No, not like that. The big change for the SCR9 Pro, aside from those three extra letters on the end, is the inclusion of a new Strixpoint APU. Well, new to me, it's been out for a few months already, but this is the first review sample I've been offered to feature it. The model number is, of course, absurd. Unfortunately, we're already knee-deep in the cringe marketing aspect of the AI product cycle, but the processor itself shows some promise. The Ryzen... 9365 is from the second tier of Strixpoint APUs, featuring a hybrid big little core layout similar to those found in the recent Intel and Apple designs. As the name would suggest, AMD have improved the NPU performance compared to previous gen chips like the 8845HS, increasing its machine learning performance from 16 tops to 50. Alas. AI in your home computer hasn't captured the audience's imagination as much as the marketing folks would like, so for the average user, the headline feature of the Ryzen 365 is that it has 10 cores and 20 threads. But if we focus on the full-size performance cores, it's really only a 4-core, 8-thread part, whereas the previous gen chips had 8 performance cores and 16 threads. Efficiency measures like this are all well and good for mobile devices, whose battery life is a major concern, but this is a desktop, and while efficiency is important to many users, so is performance. I'm also somewhat concerned about the integrated graphics. Again, on paper, the RDNA 3.5 based Radeon 880M is a downgrade from the Radeon 3 based 780M, with fewer shader units, TMUs and ROPs, and made on the same 4 nanometer process as its predecessor. However, I've been hearing some positive stuff about Strix Point's graphics up until now, so I'm hoping there's some secret source that maybe doesn't come through in the specs. The reason I'm hoping all this stuff in advance is because the SCR9 Pro comes with a hefty price tag. Before discounts, the 32GB model with a 1TB SSD comes in at $929 US dollars, or £720 at today's exchange rate. That's a better config than you get from Apple for that price, but it's over $300 more than B-Link's own 32GB SCR8 with the previous gen 8845HS, and over $200 more than the 64GB version. Hell, if you don't need the measly 16 tops of the 8845's NPU, you could save another 100 or more on the 8745HS. If this new AI-focused APU doesn't offer a healthy performance uplift in normal tasks, this could be a pretty poor value. Before we get to the benchmarks, let's look at what else your $929 gets you. Externally, the port selection is the standard B-Link fare, pretty much identical to the SCR8. The front panel is primarily slow USB ports, with both the Type-A and Type-C ports limited to 10 gigabits. The rear I.O. is a little better, but slightly confusing. There are three Type-A ports, two of which are USB 2 and one 3.2, and they aren't arranged how you'd expect, nor is the 3.2 port colour-coded. There's a single USB 4 port, capable of the full 40 gigabit throughput, but compared to some of the competition at this price point, I'm not impressed. This single Type-C is also the only official way of adding an external GPU, as there are no Oculink ports and no obvious way of adding one. There's a single 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port and two dedicated display outputs, one DisplayPort 1.4 and one unspecified HDMI that's apparently capable of 4K 240Hz. Internally, the M.2 slot comes with a 1TB NVMe drive, and that is the only thing that can be upgraded. 
The CPU is obviously soldered, and now so is the RAM. This is potentially great for gaming performance, as it runs at a whopping 8000 mega transfers, and far lower latency than standard SODIMs. But if you find yourself in need of more than 32 gigabytes of the stuff in the future, then I'm afraid you're screwed. The latest incarnation of Cinebench is still fairly new to me, so forgive my small range of comparisons. Compared to the SCR8, the 9 Pro sees a healthy 12% uplift in multi-threaded and 14% in single-threaded performance. Also noteworthy is B-Link's own GTI 14, which has an Intel Ultra 9 185H and is only about 7% slower overall. The older R23 version of Cinebench is more well known and I have more data to compare to, and of all the mini PCs I've tested so far, this one actually tops the chart, at least for the multi-threaded test. It probably won't stay there for long, I have an HX370 powered system coming soon that will no doubt do even better, but the existence of better chips doesn't diminish this one. The Geekbench 6 results also flatter the 365, it's doing a lot with just 4 performance cores and 6 efficient ones, outperforming every other mini PC I've ever tested. These are the first GPU test results I've got from the Radeon 880M, and they're a bit less impressive than the CPU. Finally, I do have the Geekbench ML results, however it's a bit of a silly test as it doesn't leverage NPUs, so the CPU test falls short of even the Ryzen 7 8745HS. Onto the 3D Mark results, and again, this tops the charts. The overall score in Time Spy beats everything I've tested that didn't have discrete graphics, and the iGPU is the secret of that success. While the 880M is scoring over 3500 points, faster than a GTX 1650, the CPU's 10.1K result is lower than most of the mobile Ryzen 7s I've tested recently. Firestrike, meanwhile, is a bloodbath. The 880M is the first iGPU I've ever tested that scores over 10K, over a thousand points clear of the nearest competitor. And while the Ryzen 365 itself isn't winning any awards, it's firmly in the middle of the pack compared to its predecessors. The Blender Classroom result from the SCR9 Pro was quite impressive, with the render completing faster than… Uh, let me check my notes… everything. Granted, a GeForce graphics card completes the test in seconds, so 4 minutes 50 isn't impressive in the grand scheme of things, but it's almost a minute faster than the previous generation mobile Ryzen 9s and leaves equivalent Intel chips in the dust. Given the Radeon 880M's apparent prowess, I decided to bring over a couple of games from my GPU test suite. Kingdom Come Deliverance 2 isn't the heaviest game in the world to run, but I did have to drop to 1080 medium to hit 30 FPS. That's without upscaling though, so if you can tolerate a bit of blur, you could maybe squeeze some extra frames out of it by dropping to low and adding some FSR. Indiana Jones requires ray tracing hardware, which we have. It also likes more than 4GB of VRAM, which by default we don't, so you might want to go into the BIOS and allocate 8GB to the iGPU because it defaults to 4. That being said, it won't help much. At 1080 low with 4GB allocated, I needed to add FSRQ to reach 30fps, and adding more VRAM only adds a couple more frames. Space Marine 2 can be rough on CPUs, but I wasn't prepared for how bad it would be on the integrated GPU here. At 1080p low, with quality FSR, the average of 30fps looks maybe kinda tolerable, but the lows are obscene. I would not recommend this experience at all. Onto something a little more in this PC's lane. Red Dead Redemption handles like a dream on this little PC. In fact, I think that might be a primary case for mini PCs as gaming rigs, something for clearing out some of the older games in your backlog, or indulging in some gaming nostalgia. At 1080p high, RDR is hovering around 70fps, with lows only slightly under 60. Sticking with Rockstar for a moment, the original version of GTA 5 would be no challenge for the 880M, at least not at 1080p. The 680M could handle it at high settings without an issue, and the 780M could manage very high. 
This review, however, happens to be around the time the Enhanced Edition made its way to PC. This adds some RT features and other graphical improvements that should be a bit more of a challenge for an iGPU. I could probably optimise this a little better, but I wanted to see how it looked with everything turned on, so I went with the very high settings with all the various RT options set to their lowest and saw 47 FPS, with lows in the mid 30s around vegetation. The problem with all the games I've featured so far is that I don't have any results from the previous generation Ryzen's for comparison. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game I've tested on a couple of iGPUs in the past. The last time I tested a B-Link with a Ryzen APU, it saw 38 FPS at 1080 low and 30 FPS at medium. This time the Radeon 880M can drive 43 FPS at low and 34 FPS at medium, so a little over 10% improved over the previous top-end model. Another viable scenario for this machine is as a casual esports platform. Apex Legends can run at reasonably high refresh rates at 1080 low, averaging 125 with percentile lows of 76. It's not easy to compare Apex results over time as things can vary depending not only on the map but also how much activity is going on, but as far as I can tell this is only about 10 FPS higher than the previous generation APU. It's a little easier to make comparisons in CS2, as I always play on the same map in the same mode. Dust 2 Deathmatch at 1080 low results in an average of 136 FPS with lows of 78. A great result, you might think, but it's also pretty much on par with the Ryzen 7 8845HS. Finally, I added Marvel Rivals, as it seems to have taken over from my previous squad shooter benchmark, Overwatch 2. The assumption is that Rivals is much heavier than Overwatch, and that's true, but Rivals isn't as bad as all that. I managed a 65 FPS average with 45 FPS lows by manually dropping all settings to their minimum and adding quality FSR, which isn't bad looking at all. My conclusion on the SER9 Pro isn't an entirely positive one. Yes, the numbers look fine. On the productivity side, it's mostly excellent, certainly better than I might have expected in some cases, but it isn't going to convert a Mac Mini user. The Cinebench 24 score might be about the same as the M4 device, at least from what I've seen of other people's testing, but the Ryzen AI 9 365 is still consuming 86 watts from the wall, more than double the Apple Silicon, and pretty much the same as the previous gen chip did in the SCR8. Gaming wise, it's fine, but again, in practical terms, it's only a small improvement over the previous generation models. Plus, the PC itself is virtually identical to its predecessor in terms of design, with connectivity that's frankly lacking compared to other mini PCs. B-Link offers an HX370 powered version of the SCR9 Pro for $1,000, $70 more than this version. I haven't tried that APU yet, but I'm guessing it's going to be worth paying the extra. Most of the hype around Strix Point was initially focused on the Radeon 890M graphics, and I think that if you're in the market for a mini PC in this price range, you probably want something that justifies that cost. The SCR8, meanwhile, can be had for under $500, or $20 more for the 32GB version. It has close enough performance in most scenarios, with similar power consumption, and it can be upgraded if the RAM or SSD isn't enough for you a couple of years down the line. The SCR9 Pro, however, hasn't learned the right lessons from the Mac Mini. It's adopted Apple's nasty habit of slapping Pro on the end without giving it the performance or connectivity to match. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.